from TMP to TTNG For sure the care in those tired meme jeans Hella can sell in the promise ring Sunny day real estate and rights this spring Prince Twinkle Daddy's help keep the dream alive I constantly thank God for Algernon and Remo Christie front drive Mineral snowing high tide hotelier and more Of the DC emotive hardcore, but you got it, man. Kyle and Ellie really on that emo bullshit. You got it. Happy anniversary, three years of the E-Word. We are bringing back our episode zero concept to celebrate the E-Word and all of our gatekeeping and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and to show our massive improvement of three years. Ellie, Austin, Texas, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing good. I don't have like a monologue because we're on like a two hour time crunch here. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, But we did grab a panel of experts to talk about are these bands emo or not? Uh, we'll start with Ian Cohen has returned to the podcast. Ian, how are you doing tonight? What's up? How's it going, y'all? Sorry, sorry for uh, the two-hour time crunch. I mean, like on only on the e-word can that like be considered like a Joyce <laughs> Manor song <laughs> version of a podcast. Incredible. Uh, and we have brought back David Anthony from about this time last year. David, mm -hmm. uh, happy to be back. This time I'm not fresh out of surgery with a bruised right. tongue and lisping right. the way yeah. through the thing. So hopefully this is a little bit better performance on my end. We uh, we also have a newcomer. We got uh, Eric Grubbs, uh, fellow Texan, uh, author of the book Post, uh, which I would describe as the Our Band Could Be Your Life for 90s post-hardcore and emo. One of my personal favorite books and uh, real glad to have him on. How you doing? Doing well. Good to be on with you guys. Finally. And I also just want to say, in addition to this being the three-year E-Word anniversary, happy early anniversary to Eric. Is your, you. your wedding anniversary is tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Three-year anniversary, uh, November 17th. Oh, wow. 17, yeah. Uh, I'm Synchronicity. glad this is how also... you're celebrating. This is, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. this is <laughs> appropriate. Hey, my, also wife the... I, my wife and I met through podcasting. I imagine so how we spent this honeymoon as well, you know, just talking about emo. <laughs> Well, it is also the one day anniversary of David Anthony chopping his thumb off. So. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Woo. It was a turnover reference, right? Oh. Lord. <laughs> uh, this maybe this is a good time to come on and say like I've listened to like half a turnover record ever. So uh, <laughs> there's I'm my take on turnover. <laughs> I too have also listened to Hyperview by Title Fight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we should let the listeners know that this is the first time that uh, Ellie and I have turned on our cameras for a podcast. So it took uh, three years of doing this <laughs> to show face. Uh, yeah, even when we did the snowing episode and they were all on camera and John Gom was being like extremely emotional, we still were just like this faceless boy <laughs> of like empty judgment. <laughs> just watching them react to each other. I mean, there's no better metaphor for emo criticism than, like, watching someone break down and cry as you just blankly in the corner, like, this is very good. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, we are bringing back the episode zero concept in which we are listing bands uh, who are debatably uh, emo, and we will debate their emo qualities or not. Um, <laughs> uh, this is basically, like, us doing, like, dead horse x for our first episode because it is a good concept except we were not very happy with how it went and we know that we could <laughs> yeah. do it better 
I think it's good that we're doing it now, like when there's no touring happening, because I imagine like all the bands or artists that we discuss are probably like, please don't call us emo. This is really going to fuck up our booking fees or whatever. <laughs> yes, but now, yeah. now there's no pressure. So it's all it's all fun and games. Right. Uh, Ellie, do you remember much about that episode? I've def- I definitely have not listened to it because it was such a struggle. I think like last year I re-listened to it and like was live texting my reaction uh, and it was, as like Anthony Fantana would say, not good. Um, <laughs> it was, it was just very uncomfortable experience. Um, I wasn't even, I was even less funny than I am now. Oh, there um, was no and, charisma but from anyone on that whole podcast. <laughs> everyone was like waiting for their turn to talk, uh, for like half a beat too long. Um, it was just like very uncomfortable and <laughs> no hate to like Lauren or Daniel for coming on, but it was just a very oddball first episode. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we improved like almost immediately because the next episode we had Matt from Darkle on um, right. RIP, but that kid is just like mountains of charisma. So real. <laughs> so for charisma, you off their energy for charisma. You called in three writers. <laughs> <laughs> that that yeah. was the plan to really up it this year. <laughs> Stars of Twitter and podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will say though, like like the concept of this episode may sound gatekeepy, but I believe everyone in this call has been paid to read sorry, to write or talk about emo in some form or another. Which I think mm-hmm. makes us somewhat qualified, you know. Fair, to, fair point. To pass fair judgment. point. Yeah, among, amongst the charisma void of, like, professional emo commentators, like, we are still the upper crust, so, <laughs> yes. you know. <laughs> well, who do we want to put on the chopping block first? Hmm. It's, your, it's your podcast, man. Let, uh, let's yeah. do it. I'm, I'm ready to roll. I say we start with Hop Along. Ooh. Good pick. Hop- yeah, very very good pick i think this is exact this is definitely one of the bands i was talking about beforehand where if like they were kind of shuffled permanently into the emo verse like they would have uh not ever opened for like the war on drugs or you know have made uh as much progress in their career as they have that being said uh one of the most memorable fest performances of all time you know you can go find like when they did tibetan pop stars um and also let's not forget that like what it was either was it mark hoppus or tom DeLong who was like responsible for like the it first was hoppus. The, okay it's, got it it's usually hoppus <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i think they they came from that world like uh get this owned very much within that within that lineage, you know, the uh, connection to Algernon. Um, I think they were, and I think this is kind of a common theme with a lot of the bands that we're going to talk about. Like, perhaps they came from that universe, but uh, shifted more towards a centrist indie sound where nothing they make uh, going forward will be considered emo. Yeah, I mean, but- I, I think Ian nailed what I was going to say. I feel like Get Disowned, I would... I would say is an emo record. I, I would like lay it down. Like I think it has enough hallmarks, but mm-hmm. while feeling its own and the connections and coming out of the scene and like just like who played on it, how it was recorded, how it was released, like everything about it at the time. The only people I knew who liked that band were people in emo, and that very quickly changed. And like that's not to say I dislike the records that follow. I think there is some of that connection, but I think it it becomes a really different thing where like. Francis's voice is really the focal point of the music moving forward. The songs take on a little bit more of a standard pop song structure. And yeah, like, I mean, they go from being a band that like I saw, there was a period I saw them when they were touring Get Disowned, like at Fest in Gainesville, but they played Chicago and it was them, Castavet, and uh, this band Jerkface who were short lived. And it's like, no one thought anything of that being weird. <laughs> and smash to like three years later it's like they're opening for built to spill and shit like it, it's just like i don't think they like ever carried the emo term at that time because it was the revival was popping off and i don't think they fully slotted in but i think retroactively they were and now we're just kind of like an indie band and that is what it is they i think they've earned the lifelong res- like no emo person is gonna ever turn on that band but yeah. I think they, they've done a very good job of, like, making that transition, like, very gracefully and 
they're not like going to they're not like doing interviews where they're like just completely shitting on their past like i've seen a lot of bands come from that world do um so yeah they're they're one of those people who they, they can come and go as they please i i, I would say to ben pop stars like i mean we had i think a lot of these ones we dave and i particularly discussed during the um during the making of the uh, vulture emo list which happened this fucking year which is hard to believe but uh-huh. um <laughs> that was that was this year and um yeah i think we, we we had a lot of discussions similar to the one with hop along where it's like yeah i guess they were in the beginning now they're kind of centrist indie and that's okay but yeah i, I would say t- tibetan pop stars is probably where it ends there's like the stuff on like freshman year and wretches and i think wretches has some more like midwest emo guitar flourishes on it yeah. and stuff like mm-hmm. that I think the stuff before that album, I think that's called Freshman Year, is like almost Kimya Dawson sounding at times. It's like very <laughs> it's fast. Folk punk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think they have played like early shows around me where I've seen them on like flyers with like P.S. Elliot and stuff like that, which kind of makes sense for that time. But yeah, like yeah, 100% yeah. rooted in DIY for sure. And Algernon was releasing them on their label and stuff before all. So I get it. I I get why they're uh, slapped in with emo bands, uh, but like I don't think anything painted shut going forward is emo. Yeah, uh, everyone pretty much already nailed what I was gonna say. Um, the only thing I would add is I think they are like the epitome of like what an emo adjacent act would be. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> like, hold on, did you? It, did you shorten it to a Jace? Because I need to like be up on the lingo. <laughs> oh, uh, Ian Cohen does not listen to Axe to Grind, yeah. apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna like say a Jace from here on out, and like, yeah, that that's gonna that's gonna prove that I'm like you know still still with it, still young and in mm-hmm. the scene. I really would have loved to have taken credit for that abbreviation, like in the moment, but I couldn't. You should um, have. I, I, I was, would have been the only one to check you, and I would not. <laughs> yeah because they're they're definitely like, like the type of band that i don't think any person who's a fan of emo could have a problem with their music in any sort of like sonic or philosophical sense like no objections um but they still just are not quite uh, a sonic fit and culturally as everyone else has already pointed out they have vaulted into the indie industrial complex good for them <laughs> yeah congrats yeah. So they're, they're, what what do they win for not being emo? Like I, I'm like trying, it, it, I'm like trying to think like yeah okay I guess they're not but I, I just wonder like what the prize is or what the like is, is, what <laughs> it's not higher being guarantee. emo is its own reward. <laughs> they can get higher than an eight point on Pitchfork. So yeah. you know they, actually I don't know if they can. Well maybe not. I, I, I can't have. speak to it. No I've way. Never I, I, the I, reviewed to get, I reviewed the Get This Own re- reissue, and that got a really that got a pretty high score. I think that got best new reissue. Ironically, that was the highest score they got. So hey, what a what a reversal where like the emo one gets the highest score. So uh, was it Eric? Do you agree? Are you, are you saying Hop Along is not emo? Can we say five out of five <laughs> emo? Uh, I I would definitely I would definitely say that they're very emo adjacent. That's 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 all I really have to say. I'm not. I'm definitely not an expert on Hop Along. I, I remember hearing about them first praised uh, by Laura Jane Grace. Mm-hmm. Ah. I forget which album she was amazed by, but she was like, "This is incredible." And so I've just kind of checked them out here and there. I mean, I interviewed Joe earlier this year for uh, for the new book because of the Algernon connection. And uh, so yeah, I mean, I don't have much to say. I have a lot to say about. Uh, other artists on here so i don't want to be the the really old guy that's like i don't know about any of these bands oh <laughs> my god why don't we talk about frail you know <laughs> yeah and i'm definitely not the type that thinks like yeah 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 guys it's too bad you missed out on emo you know it, it died in 1999 <laughs> you know and I, I i hate that generalization and you know we all know those lester bangs stephen blushes that um you know because it stopped mattering for them means that it apparently stops mattering for everyone else but Mm -hmm. uh you know Mm -hmm. i am very much of the attitude of like hey if younger bands aren't really connecting with me i'm not going to dismiss if it's making an impact on younger people because you're gonna hear uh, well i'm 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 now hearing from you know especially from david you know with what he's written about 
uh, with all the stuff that he's done for the AV Club and, uh, and Vice, it's like hearing about bands that I did not hear about when I was trying to write posts and trying to put a positive spin on all this My Chemical Romance and Matchbook Romance and Taking Back Sunday and Fall Out Boy. Just seeing some of the positives, but also like being very swayed by the negatives. And so hearing about all these emo revival bands while they were on mismatched bills and, you know, only selling like 300 copies of a record. Mm -hmm. It's like there is a younger generation that is connecting with people and we're going to be hearing about it in 10 years. So it, the cycle is a good cycle, especially in emo. For sure. Yeah. Real. All right, who can we shit on now? I <laughs> well, I, I say mean, we throw Eric... it. Th throw it to an older band. All right. Oh, an older band. Okay. All right. I'm gonna like say the Russian weaker roulette thans. wheel going. You said the weaker I, I thans. Pick, I pick the weaker thans. Um, I have always thought of them as an indie rock band formed by a guy that was in propaganda. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I have loved Left and Leaving for many years. And um, as somebody that didn't pay attention to a lot of lyrics, I, st I still like tune in and out. Um, there are so many weaker than songs that are just like so brilliantly written from the perspective of somebody who's bitter, but not totally pessimistic. You know, like plea from a cat named uh, Virtue. Songs like that, but I've I've never thought of them as an emo band. But that's my short little take. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite yeah. emo band song. Yeah, Plea was like a song that showed up on like mixes that um, uh, it was like I think every like every woman that like, I dated from the ages of like twenty two to like thirty two had that song on a mix, and like I never and like they were all like pretty straightforward like indie rock people. So to me that like. They're they're kind of a major blind spot for me. Um, aside from like Reconstruction Site, which I've listened to a few times, they've always been to me like I don't, like the Mountain Goats. Like I think of them in that sort of realm as well, or like even the Hold Steady, where it's like people like really listen for the lyrics and like so the music is somewhat incidental. Like I did not know who Propagandi was until much 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 later on. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, the sound and the style, like to me, it's, they're, they're pretty much in that, like, not like, not pop punk, but like the same where you, same place you would like put like against me or whatever, where it's like, it's kind of like, you could see, but you, you go out like a few rings in the emo like orbit and they're there. They're definitely, they're not, they're not, not, but they definitely aren't. If that makes any sense. Yeah, I I fully agree with with both Eric and Ian. There, like one of my favorite bands, where it's like unlike Ian, like I was a propaganda kid and then found <laughs> Weaker Lands and and Left and Leaving to me was like kind of my gateway to indie rock record in a sense. Huh. Um, they are weird in that like to reference a more overt uh, indie band or like emo band, The Promise Ring. Like they kind of at a certain point just become kind of a power pop band for a minute uh, with like reconstruction site onward. And like, I think that kind of sticks to reunion tour a little bit where it's like, I definitely knew the people I knew who liked weaker thans were either like died in the wool indie rock kids or like my friends who I went to go see Dillinger four with. So it was like, <laughs> I didn't really know many like emo people who like fucked with them until more recently. I think it wasn't until the past five ish years that I started seeing them get brought up more. And I think part of that is just like through a lot more of like the modern bands that kind of slot between emo pop punk, whatever referencing them and covering them and, and, and that kind of bring it like, I'm pretty sure the Wonder Years covered them, and I'm sure yeah. that like really put it on to a new group of people. But I love them, but like I, I've just never seen them as an emo band. Compare and contrast the Propagandi version of Anchorless, and then the Weaker Than's version of yeah. it. Yeah, you can you can see like what John K. Sampson was wanting to do more. I mean, Propagandi's just this. I mean, I listened to those two Fat Records. Or, Fat Records albums, and it's just mm. jaw dropping. The musicianship is like, <laughs> it's like, how in the hell do you, how in the hell do you write stuff like this? How do you play like this? And so for John mm. to just branch off on his own and do something that was more in line with like Super Junk, they had a really great run of what four proper albums and a live mm. album. And Super uh, Chunk think... eventually playing Fest. I mean, mm. that's like, that that that's like a sign of like how a Jade. 
you, you stay emo adjacent for long enough and eventually you get grandfathered in when like the in like when the indie kids have given up and like you're no longer a cool reference point when everyone else is like you know, trying to sound like, you know, Sade or like Carly Rae Jepsen, like all of those, like all of those, all of those adjacents, like they, en- like they end up being integrated into emo. That's what happened to block party as well. I mean, like true the national, like in 10 years, nobody but emo bands are going to like reference the national. Yeah. And, and Ian, I, I tweeted at the, this at you a few months ago, but I, I swear the first time I ever heard, Block Party, uh, staying fat from one of their early EPs, you know, before oh, Silent wow. Alarm. I was convinced that was Braid covering a Dismemberment Plan song. I t- listen to the first record, man. Like that sounds like nothing feels good. The rhythm section, like they sound nothing <laughs> like post punk to me. Yeah, um, yeah, but it's and so when NME was all like, "Oh, they're like the Chameleons, and they're like <laughs> they're like Joy Division," and I'm like, oh, "No way." Me? You know, yeah, and, and, not and, at all. And, and one other funny little aside is that when Silent Alarm came out, uh, there was a, an interview, a Q and A uh, with the Big Takeover, one of the like the greatest publications about you know indie rock, punk, emo uh, out there. And the first question that was asked to the singer, there's like this paragraph of all these well-known and obscure British post-punk bands, and his response is, "I've heard about." two of those bands <laughs> i have never heard the rest of them i've never heard of and i mean i don't know i think we we're all duped yeah. the silent alarm is just an incredible record but uh, uh this is the e-word podcast and i yeah. am off topic so i'll shut <laughs> up yeah they, they, i would no. i, would, I like I would put I, block, block party is like emo covert ops which is like a, an entire <laughs> different like subgenre. Mm-hmm. I liked Eric's whole spiel because I'm always down for a spot of anti-British racism. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, on the subject of the weaker thans, what I really wanted to cotton on to was, uh, Ian, kind of what you brought up about. They, John K. Sampson is like a power pop songwriter at heart, um, filtered through the lens of someone who grew up in punk. Uh, I don't know if I would draw the comparison point against me necessarily, but I was kind of thinking of, of like, in the Ted Leo sort of space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely coming from someone who was informed by punk, but making like pure sweet pop with very thoughtful lyrics. Um, the whole steady comparison is also like very on point, not necessarily in the fact that those lyrics sound similar, uh, like cadence wise or influence wise, but uh, in, in the type of people who, who glom onto them. Exactly. Definitely. But I, I do see I do see a future in like six or seven years where the weaker thans are very much considered like a like a seminal emo band by by the the young ones. Well, a lot of people are getting into them via modern baseball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the first time I heard modern baseball was like, okay, this Jake guy is a weaker thans fan for sure because the way he sings, the way he writes songs are definitely John K. Samson esque, and I think he's like confirmed that and whatnot. Yeah, Bindu and Love David said Beach. the Wonder Years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Slaughter Beach Dog is like also like when I interviewed um, Jake about that most recent record, it's like we bring up like how a lot of the people he was into, like John K. Samson, like they eventually did their kind of more acoustic thing exactly like he's doing so yeah definitely definitely a model you'll the weaker than so like their future is in like kind of being re rebranded in a way as emo and you know sorry like sorry not sorry i don't know maybe like there is if festivals ever do come back there is you know doing riot fest for like jaw maybe not jawbreaker money but like you know a good you know a good chunk of change i saw john like this time last year and it was like the most uncomfortable show i've been to just because everyone was just fucking bawling for like like there 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 was like a new person bursting into tears for each song well i saw him on that same run so it was probably like either the day before or day after you did probably and it was great but it was literally just like the most quiet and polite yes. sing-along i've ever heard where people are just like just like really not wanting to disturb anyone else or like sing loudly Mm -hmm. um and it was tight but yeah like it's it's a very bookish type of person who Mm -hmm. likes punk yes yeah Yeah. i ikea core yeah (laughs) (laughs) 
Ian brought up Jawbreaker. You want to do Jawbreaker? It's a big one. Oh, man. Um, last time I saw Jawbreaker, first off, like, Waxahachie was opening uh, for them. Um, and they spent, like, a not insignificant not a insignificant amount of time just shitting on uh, Brand New. And this is post-cancellation. Um, but, yeah, so, like, I think that they... They're, like, one of those bands, like, I was referring to when we were talking about Hopalong, who would just, like complete like i have no interest like w- whatsoever in being slotted in with uh this even though like it's like sorry you are but i don't i don't know like i'm not really a jawbreaker expert like one of my secret shames is that like i'm not really into this band uh i mean since we're getting this all out on the out on the table now but i mean i think they are an emo band against their will that's all i can really say about them <laughs> Uh, as as a Jawbreaker mega fan, uh, they are absolutely an involuntary emo band. Involuntary <laughs> yeah. emo. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah uh, emo cover, uh, involuntary emo. Here's, like I love yeah. how granular this is. When uh when 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 I saw them, uh, Mitch Clem was DJing for it, like <laughs> doing like a DJ set before the before the show, uh, and to to me that's like really like defines like jawbreakers reflexive attitude towards being in the emo box uh because they absolutely consider themselves like a punk band you know coming up in that bay area scene uh they definitely think of punk as like sort of like a platonic ideal and have no time for various subgenre distinctions and whatnot but it's it's inarguable like whether you're listening to unfun and hearing like the guitar kind of like like the high wire sort of ultra cinematic dramatic things that uh blake does with the guitar in like the bridge to fine day or whether you're listening to dear you and you hear all of jet black like it's it's just prone the number two the number two song on vulture's best emo songs of all time list (laughs) Uh, stellar fucking song um but it's it's just it's just in their dna whether they like it or not they definitely uh kept distilling like and i don't even know if rites of spring were a main influence for them but and and this may also be like a controversial thing to say but i really can draw a straight line between what they are doing with post hardcore and what rites of spring were was doing like with the beginnings of post hardcore they were really kind of expanding what they could i mean i agree completely and i think that's the thing that kind of gets lost talking about them is that they're basically first wave like they started in 87 in new york 86 i think yeah 86 and it was under a different name so they didn't put anything out until a few years later but like you know they were drawing from kind of a weird pool of influences and i think that's the thing is like it's funny because yeah i think they get viewed kind of in that like post first wave kind of pre-genuine second wave binary but really i think they're the connective tissue between the two where like they kind of understood and were pulling the same references, like knowing how into like the references that they pulled of even like weird shit, like naked Ray gun, which was big in like Chicago and Gainesville, almost exclusively for some reason. (laughs) And like how much they influenced like the first wave, no idea records bands like spoke and like all those types of bands, like they really have this long, weird lineage and I think they, yeah, like they were a punk band, but I think they really define like everyone would be referencing them by 1996. Everyone was like, everyone in a band was trying to do what they were doing. And I think they kind of just have like four records that are like basically the template for four different styles of what I would consider to be modern emo. Yeah. And I yeah. think like whether or not they were intending for that, that's kind of what they left behind. I just want to uh, say like how fucking astute does Dave sound in those like <laughs> last two minutes? Like they're the connected. Like I, I, I'm being like wholly sincere, but like that should be on TV. Like that is like <laughs> that is some like real historical. Like that is knowledge dropping right there, man. Wow. I've spent too much time reading old zines that no one else <laughs> yes. has to read. This yeah. is my unfortunate legacy. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me let me give you all a personal uh, something that I saw like firsthand about the influence of Jawbreaker is that um, are y'all familiar at all with the Deep Elm band Slow Ride? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Uh, slow ride is uh, from. No, here. I'm straight up fog hat when it comes to that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so they started here in Dallas. They were actually the very first band I ever interviewed. I saw them open for Strung Out, and I thought they sucked. But um, <laughs> I mean, because like back when they first started, they were doing straight up like lag wagon, you know, like that. And, um, <laughs> and and so I I didn't Let the record think they show were... that Dave put his thumb down in a big way. Yeah. So <laughs> when... I I I didn't I wasn't impressed by them. However, a, a classmate of mine was like, "Hey, I'm good friends with them," and I had a radio show at KTCU in Fort Worth. And so Dan called me up and was like, "Hey, can we do an interview on your show?" And I was like, "Sure." And so I had them on and. Dan gave me this cassette tape of four new songs that they had recorded, and they were much slower than anything on their first EP. And I remember sitting in their van one night and uh, talking about the greatness of this out of print Jawbreaker record. About, like, I even said to Dan, Hey, if you ever find a copy of Dear You, let me know because I'd like to, I'd like to hear this record. What is this? And, and this was just before Napster. And so there was all this buzz about this great album. And, and the thing was, is that I listened to this tape and it's some of the best songs that Slow Ride ever did. And as they continued to do more stuff, the songs got slower and slower. And it was so obvious of a Jawbreaker influence that for people that would have just like, you know, cast off emo, it's like slow, jazzy and wimpy, actual words that pop punk friends of mine said about you know don't listen to emo eric it's it's slow anticlimactic and kids cry at shows um 1998 oh, yeah. <laughs> uh that's when i was told um but then you know seeing that kind of influence on jawbreaker was it was amazing and one of my favorite quotes that um of all the people that i interviewed for post adam told me it's like nobody called us an emo band back in the day but i think in in Jawbreaker's case, it's kind of hard to call. It's not necessarily okay to call them a punk band. It's not okay to call them a pop punk band. They're like a bruised punk band. I guess you can call them emo. Okay. Now, another act that we're going to be talking about at some point tonight is a band that I get extremely defensive about when people want to call them emo. But let's just wrap up the jawbreakers <laughs> I, i'm excited I, to I see what that I, is yeah i think i know i think i know what band i think i know here. but um i just wanted to say kind of going back to uh david's uh, extremely uh astute history lesson and this might again be heresy but i i think that jawbreaker in a weird way functioned as like a twin brother to moss icon and that the uh, influences hmm. they were taking from in a big way were in a lot of ways, equal parts hardcore and equal parts post-punk. And so they weren't making, like, straight down the dial post-hardcore. Uh, they were, like, truly making, like, a, like a more expansive, uh, I don't want to say cinematic again, so I'll just say theatrical uh, or dramatic. Uh, Filmic. Uh, Filmic is another good one. Yeah. Uh, spin spin on, that, on that sound, but where Moss Icon uh, went in, like, a more, I guess, uh, visceral, explosive direction. Uh, Jawbreaker, the, the adjective that always gets used to describe it, is bruised. So they, they, like, rolled back into themselves, which I almost think makes them more emo. Fair. Yeah, I, I would have to say, like, fandom of Jawbreaker is, in the last few years, has been great because... You don't have to bring it up with the caveat of, oh, well, you know, they did sign with the major label. Oh, and, and it's like, you know, uh, I mean, like so many people hated Dear You. Not everybody, but a lot of people hated Dear You because of the fact that I equated it to like, and it is equated in Don't Break Down, the documentary, that it was like, what if Fugazi signed with Atlantic Records? What if Atlantic Records actually signed them? And this is a this is a well-known story about how you know, Atlantic Records wanted to buy Discord <laughs> and get Fugazi on their label. And so it's never actually been fully explained why Blake made a total 180, you know, saying at concerts, we will never sign with the major label. We'll never do this. And then they signed with the major label because the band was about to fall apart again because the band had broken up right after Unfun. 
got back together and then they were all hating each other and Blake was becoming more and more of a person that uh, Chris absolutely detested. And so <laughs> they decided to do the band one, you know, for one more record. And, uh, you know, strangely, it's like, I kind of knew about Jawbreaker, but I really got into Jets to Brazil and I did not understand why a site like Buddyhead just ripped everything <laughs> Jets to Brazil apart. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, but yeah. In, but in retrospect, I can understand why people would be like, you know, like, Want is like my favorite song of all time. I have it tattooed on my the lyrics, tattooed on my back. And now, what the fuck is this shit? You know, you're having the time of my life. You know, that's that was their mentality. But I always saw it as like really melodic, great music. Um, but yeah, Jawbreaker is a great band to see these days. I mean, I, when I saw them at the Bomb Factory here last year, it was great that they could play something like Jet Black with Want. And, you know, people aren't going to be like, man, fuck this shit, man. <laughs> Why are they British too? Yeah. <laughs> all that all that kind because of because every bad person is british Ian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean you we all know those haters that are hateful for really no reason yeah i prefer and, to be it, a hater to be hateful for reasons you know? yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, i mean like my, my oh, hate I my haterism is very well considered <laughs> yeah i want to share I, this one great blake yeah. story from when they played Je just brazil played the metro and he like ambles over to the piano to start a song, and someone goes, "Billy Joel!" <laughs> <laughs> goes into the mic. It's like, well, at least that's funnier than that jawbreaker shit. Even wow. at a point, he was way the fuck over it. Yeah, and you know, seeing Jawbreaker last year, they were so happy to be together. And I had seen Blake play a solo show a few years prior, and he was. Uh, Ooh, yeah, I've heard wild. things about those. Yeah, but I mean, he was like happy to talk to anybody and everybody. And here I am wearing my donut friend Java Breaker shirt. Oh yeah! And he was super, super nice, you know. And I said, "Hi, Blake. Um, thanks for recently becoming Facebook friends with me." And, um, <laughs> and like, I just wanted to ask because I'm reviewing the show for Central Track. What was the name of that new song that you played? It was a Crown of Thorns song. <laughs> I mean, he was so nice about it. So. Can I just say real quick, today was clearly the wrong day for me to put on my contacts. I feel so <laughs> left out. <laughs> um, right, so who also, do we have next? I want to do American football. While we're <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I just preface all of this? Is oh. that they were known in 99. They were around. People like them. However... When you release your self-titled and only full-length album in the same year, that very emergency, something to write home about, Pedro the Lions, uh, I'm blanking on which record, but so many great emo post-hardcore records came out that the American football record was just kind of like a, like kind of a quiet favorite. And so this mythos about this band has become way bigger than it ever was. That said, you know, I, I, I didn't really check it out when it originally came out because I was too busy listening to Reggie and the Full Effect and something <laughs> all about very emergency and Hoops the Among Us. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, face to and face to faces, ignorance is bliss and all that stuff, uh, as well as uh, Ben Folds Five Unauthorized Biography of Ronald Mesner. And so it's like I, I eventually came back around to it when LP two came out. Yeah, a very emo band and uh, I David, you nailed it on the head when you said on the Spinning Out podcast that it's like it's di it's dinner party music for people that like indie rock and a little bit of emo but don't like too much emo. I remember Shannon from Awake But Still in Bed said like said something along the lines of it's like it's great music it's great music for when you're in college or when you're right out of college. The the angst that is sung about is like right in line. So very an emo band to me. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, <laughs> like I'm gonna have to cut off my left fucking arm if like this band is not emo. Okay, so like uh, I'm not I'm not sure why this band is even on the list. I mean, I know that um, math rock. Like I've seen I've seen the first American Football album show up on like best math rock albums, or maybe even best post rock albums as well. Like I think it. The, the popularity and the influence has become so immense that it 
kind of, it's crossed over to genres maybe perhaps that like it wasn't uh seen as in the first place but give me a fucking break like there is no <laughs> like this th- this is a sh- this is a short fucking conversation as far as i'm concerned unless uh um and moreover like you know when you look at like what mike kinsella has done in the time since like being in like owls for example like joan of arc there 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 it's like owen for that matter like all of this stuff is very much within like the like he will not deny being like an emo dude so i mean this to me is like now i know i whether or not people like american football on this podcast i know that there's a bit of a discrepancy with that i don't think i like, like american football <laughs> okay. if you're talking about me i like them i know okay. ellie's play from 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 here on out because we've had this talk and we've done this podcast before but i'll just say like even if it's just like a soft math rock album what's become after it like yeah it's definitely emo it, yeah, it, it this it's is... efor- it's like informed too much to not be emo or to not not be emo yeah so yeah, I, and I think even the stuff that they still – like, the stuff they make now is still – like, even if it is, like, a lot more um, straightforward and, it, like, you – it's still – like, the new shit's also emo. Like, mm-hmm. um, It's I more think elevator it's, music sounding, but it is emo. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to hold it against anyone who thinks this shit is, like, total soft batch music and, like, for – you know, people who like a little bit of emo and like mostly indie rock. I, I mean, think it's that definitely the... it's definitely a bridge, but like to me, like they are definitely an emo band. Like I would never say anything otherwise. And I think yeah. if we're gonna go on like the like soft math rock thing, I think the big thing that we're like musically sure, I'll, I'll say that like this is like a light Don Cab record or something. <laughs> yeah. But like. The difference is they were the first one to make the lyrics and the presentation not, like, heavy, esoteric bullshit. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, like, they were really bringing in, like, this very, like, just kind of plain-spoken, hushed vocal thing, which pulls so much from, you know, knowing Mike's influences, like, yeah. fucking Britpop, shoegaze stuff. And I don't know if we yeah. see that really get the revival that it did. And, like, people thinking a band like Pity Sex was emo or whatever yeah. without those things starting to merge. And I think at a certain point, there are always those records that like kind of coalesce across a few different lines. And like, this is one of them, but like, yeah, I mean, it's definitely like when I say they're like soft dinner party music, like they are, but I fucking love it. Yeah, so, I, I, I want to like, gonna... go to that dinner party. I, I'd rather go to that dinner. If I'm going to have to go to dinner parties, I'd rather have it be that than like, I don't know, listening to, I, I don't want to, I'm, I'm just trying to step lightly to figure out like what modern indie band I could bring up. Like they <laughs> probably won't. Right. No, I, I would go much harder, but I don't even know modern indie bands or what they sound like. So, you know, that is what it is. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think they're an emo band and I definitely, they're one where like they got so big and like, I, I get why people wouldn't fuck with it. It's definitely, yeah. it feels very much I think so much of the revival bands pulled from it and what a lot of the guitar work did and, and really the jazziness of the rhythm section, I think it's brought into a lot of bands yeah. kind of in like a side glance kind of way. But I mean, that first record, like I'm not going to say a bad fucking word about it. I'll, okay. So first of all, uh, I feel like I should like, clarify that my, band on this list? <laughs> like... <laughs> that, that my stance on this issue has softened considerably over the last three years. Um, <laughs> I, I I am willing to accept arguments made for for future influence, um, and I also want to preface this uh, by saying that like honestly, I think bands might be better if they're not emo. So there's no there's no reason to get like mad if they're not emo. Um, uh, of course. <laughs> but sure, everything that that you've all said, I've I've taken it into my heart, and I I'm living with it. But. If, if any one of you four can tell me how, in 1999, it sonically slotted into a lineage of emotive hardcore, I will give you a fucking cookie. I think it was just um, in the same way that, like, I, I, you could look at, like, Rainer Maria or whatever. Like, I think they had, like, the same aspects of, like, bringing... It, it just kind of shifted the conversation a bit, like, bringing in, like, Steve Reich and, you know, the post-rock stuff that was happening in in chicago at the time but like doing it within an emo band context 
you know, and also like if they weren't in cap and jazz, like perhaps we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. So it's similar, you know, when, when you, when, I think a lot of this comes from like associations, like a lot of bands that we probably are going to talk about or have talked about, um, you know, it's like, are they on run for cover or are they on, on like uh, dead oceans? You know, did but, they come from yeah, Philadelphia? But... Or... The uh, the associations can only take you so far because I mean are the are the Get Up Kids a metalcore band? I mean, kind of. They covered Motley Crue. <laughs> <laughs> they covered Coalesce. Yes, they did. They, they they did cover Coalesce. Yeah, on the on the split that Coalesce covered the yeah, Get Up Kids. Yeah, but I mean, if we're, are we, if we're talking about like whether emo means like per, like post hardcore, like you know, coming from that realm, then like the conversation narrows a lot more. And this, you know, uh, like can we like what about like Dev Cab or it's so hard to define what this is because like, you know, are we talking about like emo as in like shorthand for emotional hardcore? Or are we talking about it from like this kind of ephemeral sense of like, you know it when you see it. And well, yeah. And I think to your point, like if, if it's all based on whether or not it can draw back to that line, I would argue a lot of modern emo doesn't pass that. Absolutely. And, I, and yeah. I agree. I agree. This, uh, the reason I wanted to bring American football into this conversation is because taking a more philosophical and what's what's the reverse descriptive instead of prescriptive uh take on on what emo means is is going to have ramifications for where we come down on certain bands further down on the list so sure. if the ver if the verdict is american football is emo and all four of you say yes so i am going to make it a five out of five <laughs> that means that that means that we have to take that aspect into consideration uh, when we ta when we tackle other things, awesome. and I think so, that's, that's a I'm fair. Setting, that's fair. Yeah, I'm setting a judicial precedent. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Stack uh, the course with American football fans. There we go. <laughs> all right. So, Let's go, Jeff Rosenstock. Uh, that's what I vote. Oh, not that's emo. That, not, <laughs> not emo. Not emo. Jeff's too. Jeff's too pure of heart to be emo. Like I almost feel. I almost feel bad. Like not not an insult, but like it kind of limits what he does like uh, he's definitely not like he can you know a hero for a lot of emo people but like his stuff is like power pop like at least now mm -hmm. um yeah I, I think this is definitely not but like if you don't listen to like pop punk or like anything like if you're you know like some of my colleagues let's say who really don't fuck with this style of music at all you might look at jeff rodenstock say oh yeah he's emo because so, it's just like a lot of emo people like him, but the music itself, not. Nah. So he's, I would be curious if someone tried to argue that Jeff Rosenstock is post emo, though. Oh, because I think Bond the music industry might have been the first post emo. I think they're like proto post emo. I think that's like a big brain take is that they're proto post, <laughs> which yeah. is like the most bullshit thing in the world. But like they definitely influenced everyone that has gotten yeah, the, the, the little the, this last they, beach they were actually night. ninth wave emo <laughs> <laughs> they were ninth wave but like doing so from a retro like they were the future but like they're like time travelers in a way uh -huh. I, yeah i, I mean yeah, that like jeff rosenstock in a like jeff rosenstock like the solo stuff definitely not but i do think there's merit to saying that like bomb the music industry is something that similar to the weaker than it's like kind of unintentionally uh, set the parameters for like post emo, you know, in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think huh? Vacation is such an influential record, and like yeah. when those last two bomb records, but Vacation especially, like they're doing the big guitar Weezer sound thing, which also not emo in my opinion, but whatever, we'll get there. Uh, but like, I, I think so many people pulled from that, and I think they were such a tent pole in that world that like they were one of those where it's like it's weird for me to think of them as post emo because in that sense they're also like post ska yeah. because i mean it was <laughs> i think that's the big thing that needs to be discussed with a lot of this is like ska was so fundamental to that and i think that honestly when you look at them from a structural perspective like ska and emo in terms of like counter melodies and how they build those things aren't that different from like a compositional standpoint but like what is doing that heavy lifting and those counterpoints are drastically different so i feel like it's you know it's one of those weird things where it's like i like jeff a lot i like his records and like he's a great dude but like i've just i've never seen it and like even in the post emo sense like i think he's just more like post org core if i'm gonna do that. 
really prescri- prescriptive here. Yeah, I, I, I would, I, I've seen him play a couple of times, and it's more like in line of like this is a very big comparison, but it's more like seeing Bruce Springsteen than say seeing really anybody else because it's just everything that he puts into how he sings and his band is incredible. You know, and keep in mind, this is the same guy that the first time I heard London Calling, I was like, this doesn't sound punk. This sounds more like Bruce Springsteen. (laughs) So take that for what you will and tweet all the hate at E-R-I-C underscore (laughs) G-R-U-B-B-S. Has anyone heard Jeff's band Kudro? Yeah. That's I like, saw Kudrow. Oh, shit, yeah. They're, like, the closest thing that he's traditionally gotten to emo because it's kind of more angular. Well, and I think it's the players who are yeah. in that band because yeah. that's, like, Mike Campbell who's in Ladderman and, like, mm-hmm. that is more that Long Island vibe and he mm-hmm. was obviously from Long Island, but everyone in Bomb is, like, ska people. Yeah. And if you look at the band playing in Jeff Rosenstock, like, again, we're looking at ska people, like, Dan Podhast was an MU330, guys. Like, what are we talking about? <laughs> I think that the kids want to believe that Jeff is emo just because he's catchy. And that's their... Because he's and, great. I mean, yeah. he's and, the guy you want... Like, you always want Jeff to be on your side, you yeah. know? Yes. Like, yeah. on your team. Like, he's su- like he such a, he's like such a, just such a hero, man. Like, those last three records, it's just... Like, how can you top that, you know, as far as like speaking to the moment and like, but, but also like being in a way like eternal, like all three of those, those records. I mean, We Cool is a great record. Don't get me wrong, but like Worry Post and No Dream. It's like, yeah, when I look back on like the shittiness of this era, but like also the shittiness that preceded it and that will continue like he just nails it every single time and i think in a weird way no dream got taken for granted this year um it's kind of crazy because uh we cool was my album of the year in 2015 Ah. and it's now like objectively the weakest jeff rosenstock solo record yeah it's Um, wild it's just the least consistent one like i mean i remember hearing that record for the first time and like the song i'm serious i'm sorry coming on i was like fuck like that one like leveled me but like yeah, and I love that record. But like, Worry came out. I was like, well, holy shit! Like, yeah, Worry. Just... The, the Abbey Road of emo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Punk? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> if if uh, that's what we'll call it, that will allow him to be emo. Just one tangential thing I wanted to bring up. I so I understand. Like, I don't necessarily agree, but I do understand the point of view of someone who prefers jeff rosenstock solo to bomb the music industry but what i can't comprehend is people who love jeff rosenstock and don't fuck with bomb the music industry in the least and i know uh, more than one person like this i i, I can think i can think of like i think a lot of the people who like came to jeff rosenstock later you know probably the people who jumped on like once he became this kind of dude who was you know maybe doing late night shows or getting covered on bigger sites or whatever like they these aren't people who take ska like they reflexively see scott's like oh yeah that's fucking dumb shit you know so i i get it because like i think i occupy that world of people <laughs> i mean you could say that but i think that like even by the time of a record like get warmer the the ska influence is part of like this big melange of just batshit crazy spastic yeah genre it's, grafting it's like a flex that at like, that point because he could just yeah. break into ska and yeah, go no, back I to tell you what when he, when when he played a fu- i can't recall offhand the name of the ska song on worry towards like second half but like rainbow he did play rainbow. that at pitchfork festival yeah rain he played that pitchfork festival and like what a moment like <laughs> i had what such a a nice moment that was not only did he walk out to the Weird Al version of the Red Hot yeah. Chili Peppers song, uh, Better Rock <laughs> Anthem, but then he throws a ska song in there, and I was just yeah, like, this is... says, like, how much he got paid yeah, for it. that's like, what I remember. I was, that was, like, one of the few years I wasn't there, but, like, wow, what, what a moment for... What a moment for the scene, you know? Yeah, I mean, as someone who, like, came up in, like, around Bomb the Music Industry and saw them a lot, like... Even people around then, I knew a lot of people didn't like him because they were fucking awful live for a long, <laughs> long time. Like, I saw some train wrecks of bomb shows. Uh, Their stage band did you say that they bombed? The oh, boy, did they bomb. Uh, let me tell you all about it. 
Um, but like, I mean, I think it's vacation. Like if you like his solo stuff, I think scrambles vacation, maybe the adult CP, like th- that sets up the thing, but like, yeah, he's definitely doing something that is distinctly different now. And it makes sense to me why it's under another name. Like, I think, I think vacation really is a nice endpoint for that band. It's weird. Cause I love the more mature stuff that Jeff is mature, whatever, <laughs> uh, but like the more stereotypically mature stuff that Jeff's doing now. But my favorite bomb album is still to leave or die in long Island. Uh, I, that, special that was the first one I heard. Yeah. I mean, the every time I die song <laughs> is, so yes. <laughs> get up one, two, three. Yeah. So funny. <laughs> well, I feel like we've lost uh, our other, uh, panelists, so we should, yeah. we should move on. All right. Okay. Let's do Weezer. Ooh. Okay. I, should I, be know, short. I, I, is... I know Eric wants to do this one. I, I have been wanting to just yell this. <laughs> um, okay. What's a recurring thing about when I was preparing for this show, and I'm probably going to say it a lot until we finish recording, is that I can distinctly remember how things were back in the day, and <laughs> I've seen how things have changed over time. And you know, younger generations can take on, you know, it, it, how it means to them. That's, I got to respect that. But as far as like speaking for where I came up, this is where I, I, I get very riled up when I hear Weezer be called an emo band. Now, here's what I... pure revisionist. Yeah, I mean, it's pure oh, yeah. revisionist history because, but it's kind of like, I understand why, but it basically comes down to this. Weezer's blue album classic Rick Ocasek produced record just incredible songs one after another and uh you know they were more in line with like Van Halen than than they were never ever called an emo band then they put out Pinkerton Pinkerton was never called an emo classic it was called a commercial disappointment and Rivers Cuomo was embarrassed about how frank he was in the lyrics, whether he was talking about tired of having too much sex or masturbation or he wants to get back to the good life and all that. It was like being a Weezer fan was kind of a bad thing. I still distinctly remember my friend Tim Wise, who was a huge Weezer fan, said to me the day that Pinkerton came out, it's like, dude, I listened to the new Weezer record. It sucks. <laughs> and, and then just a couple of years later, I'm in college, and the word was, it's like, Weezer's getting back together. And my friends were all excited about it, but I was like, but wait, I thought you all dismissed Weezer. And then suddenly all these bands like the Get Up Kids, Hot Rod Circuit, um, Ultimate Fake Book, Ozma, <clears throat> Ozma, um, <laughs> The Stereo, they were all name-checking Weezer. And so then... It's like, okay, it basically was like, you can be a nerd and you can rock out. Somehow that turns into Weezer's an emo band. (laughs) And uh, I very much am like, no, they're not an emo band. They're a very influential band on a ton of emo bands. But I've never thought of them as an emo band. Rant over. (laughs) Yeah, they're they're definitely not. If the 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 long view of their career, it's like totally not. Pinkerton is, I want to say, it's almost like metal machine music, like kind of creating its own genre within the larger context of like a career that had nothing at all to do with it. it they're an undeniable influence on stuff that would be called emo nowadays without hesitation. Uh, oh, you mean kind of like American football? <laughs> Not not quite in the same way, because you can sound like American football, and like if you sound a little bit like American football, you're probably an emo, you're like almost certainly an emo band, but if you sound like Weezer, you might not necessarily be an emo band. Like, you can do other things with it, but I, like, Pinkerton, yes, but like, it's it's like this anomaly, like it's accidentally emo. Um, mm-hmm. Like, if you, if you just like tweak the blue album just a little bit if like the production was more raw and a lot of the uncomfortable candor of the first record was like a little more like problematic that because like you know you listen to a song like no one else or the world has turned and left me here you know those are give it the dirty up the production a bit like yeah that could be kind of emo sort of and they did it for one album he was as eric was saying 
Rivers wasn't like mad about the critical reception. He was mad about like the fact that it sold pretty poorly. And you know, from that point forward, you would, he's just done. He's just been very intentionally crass and commercial in a way that like resembles Kiss, which is like his favorite band of all time. And yeah, I don't get mad when people think of Weezer as an emo band. Like if you want to by all means do so i mean if that if better people thinking that's an emo band like some other examples but they they just somehow stumbled upon being an emo band even though they're not at all yeah i feel like yeah, a- they they kind of occupy the space of what we were talking about with hop along where like they're just kind of a band who definitely has emo songs like yeah, for sure definitely are. like i mean my I didn't get into them until I was a little older because I heard the Green Album and was like, well, this shit sucks, and just did oh, not... Ter- terrible fucking record. And then finally went back, and I was like, oh, the world has turned and left me here as an emo song. Like, <laughs> yeah. sorry. Like, it's there on the Blue Album. Um, and, like, I don't think that, like... I think they occupy that kind of space. Like, yeah, they definitely weren't called it. But, like, the fact that, like, you know, Matt Pryor tells stories about the Get Up Kids being like, yeah, we want the drum sound on our record to sound like Pinkerton. There's a crossover. The fact they that... They never accomplished that. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that on those, like, Weezer reunion tours, they were taking out the Get Up Kids. Like, they weren't worlds apart, but yeah. they aren't in the same field. Yeah. So. Saves the day. I remember when I interviewed Chris yeah. Conner, saves the day. he talked about going out on tour uh i think it was green album when they put out uh stay what you are and yeah that's the tour that andy greenwald wrote about and nothing feels good yeah the less we talk about that book the better. <laughs> i think like pinkerton is so weird because it's like the album that everybody wants to make because everyone wants to make like a pop punk album and then like make something that's a little darker and like yeah. nine out of ten times started. it's just not good <laughs> I just yeah. well, I think it was, like I think what Dave Friedman was like a, a an engineer on that one, and mm-hmm. it, he ends up doing like um, those Thursday albums that were like super when Jeff got a voice coach. So I mean, there's yeah. a, a little bit of connection there, but it's like I just wish Dave Friedman would work with more emo bands to get that drum sound, which is like regardless of what you think about like Weezer within even w- within the context of this conversation or outside like the bass and the drums on that record are just nasty. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just love the way they sound. Like, that is just such a nasty sounding record for a major label release. Yeah, like, there's the a, kick, the there's... snare, and the ride cymbal bell. Just yeah. incredible. And you just think of, like, a guy like Pat Wilson, like that dude, playing drums <laughs> that sound like that. It's just such an image, you know? Yeah. Even the guitar tone. There's a reason that Weekend Nachos covered weezer like they were they were trying to like nail that guitar tone like the solo on tired of sax sounds like so fucking dirty um but i will say you know i like a lot of corny and embarrassing music but pinkerton is one of the few albums that i feel actively ashamed of enjoying uh because the lyrics are just so repugnant like (laughs) just just, like really disgusting i mean Uh, it it really kind of exposes how nasty men can be uh, towards women how they feel about themselves and it's kind of like if pinkerton is your life you gotta step back and wonder yeah how are you treating people especially Uh in in a weird yeah in a weird way though it's like it's not like um and it, it, it almost seems like, you know, Rivers, like, didn't quite grasp exactly what he was saying. It's like, you know, when you look, think about, like, the the emo bands that, like, are seen as, like, the the, the stereotype of, uh, oh, yeah, emo is just about, like, wanting to chop up your ex-girlfriend because she broke up with you. Like, there was, like, a knowing kind of, like, theatrical mm-hmm. nature to that. Like, you know, early Taking Back Sunday or early Brand New. I don't think, like, Rivers, Cuomo, like... I, you know, I've met him, like, I've interviewed him a few times, and he's, like, a deeply weird guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, like, I think with Pinkerton, um, I don't see the same, like, I think he was just, like, really just kind of, like, being honest and, like, it's, like, a, a com- lack like, of like, self-awareness. Saying, yeah, it's a lack of self-awareness. I think that's a very good way of putting it, which, not that it redeems it by any means, but... And also, you know, like Weezer does have like a very large like female fan base, but um, yeah, I, I don't think he has the same sort of like there. There isn't a knowing knowingness to it. He was just like, 
I, I, I also just like, what the hell, like to hear that album in like a major label meeting, and like, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gonna follow up because like it's not like they were in you, it's not like they were in Nirvana where they had these like punk girls where making something like in utero made a lot of sense, you know? It's it's it like was no, one this, of those. It's one of those you're rapping about homosexuals and Vicodin type moments. <laughs> like... <laughs> Dude, Tower Records told me to shove this record up my ass. Yeah. <laughs> what it's like to be told. <laughs> that was clearly a joke specifically for Ian. Holy shit. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it, it, but... but like to say, like Weezer and Eminem, I'm sure they have like what it, it is does hit similar sort of uh, nerves, you know? Unfortunately, yes. Um, well, I this uh, real quick tangent and also like a content warning because uh, I'm going to talk about sexual assault in a very abstract sort of vague way here. Uh, but there's like a, a dude I know who was very active in like the New Jersey hardcore scene in the 90s who never listened to Weezer in his entire life until like a couple weeks ago. And he listened to the whole record and he was like, did you know there's a song at the end of this record that is apologizing for rape? And uh, Butterfly is obviously about, you know, cheating. The The fact that it could be so easily misconstrued <laughs> as Oof. being about something so terrible does not reflect very well on the tone that Rivers evinces throughout that entire record. Yeah. <laughs> True. We're, we're, like, talking about, like, not being self-aware, but he also wrote the album, like, three different times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, bum, bum, bum note to end on. Yeah. 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 So Weezer not about Def Cam for Cutie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Def Cam. Uh, speaking of problematic songs, like yeah, very short line between uh, Pinkerton and like a song like Tiny Vessels, right? Yeah. Uh, I always thought of them as like kind of a mopey indie rock band, and then the OC comes along, and suddenly they're an emo band. Yeah. And it's like, oh, oh, okay, all right. I mean, I, I remember, like, this local band in Fort Worth, like, they love shoegaze, but also love Death Cab. From especially Photo Album, we have the facts and we're voting yes. Like, they wanted to sound exactly like Death Cab. And um, once again, going back to the whole thing, I'm, like, not really paying attention to lyrics. I didn't really understand why people were all, like, whoa is that song styrofoam plates about his dad whoa what's all this and then you find out like ben gibber just like writes in different character voices yeah and so i i just kind of took that as like i don't think death gab is emo but um you know i can understand why a lot of people do think that they are given the subject matter of a lot of their songs the thing about like death gab is especially since you mentioned styrofoam plates or song like tiny vessels which isn't like autobiographical the thing about ben gibbard's voice is that it is so easily construed as like emo like just basically like when when people like think of emo as being like, a wimpy ass dude like you always <laughs> imagine someone looking like ben gibbard <laughs> yeah. singing it so like it's it's so like you figure even if it isn't ben gibbard it's a guy who kind of looks like him or acts like him and so um their roots though are like really in like pacific northwest indie like their first album sounded a fuckload like built to spill which in a weird way built to spill has become like a primary influence for a lot of emo bands but mm -hmm. i don't think you call them emo but like their old stuff is like kind of slow core ish like low or early modest mouse and you know being on barsook records it's but also like, i think that it's impossible to construe of like what culturally emo is seen as without death cap for cutie like it's it's similar to like bright eyes in a way it's mm -hmm. you just can't i guess deny. we can knock bright eyes off the list now yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, like i mean i think they like they they are like i think these are the bands that get to the real crux of like are we talking about emo as something with a direct and unbreakable lineage from like post hardcore, like, you know, revolution summer, or are we talking about it as like a cultural construct? Mm -hmm. um, but, and like where, why does death cab and bright eyes get included, but like built to spill or like, you know, like, you know, emo rappers don't, you know, be, like, well, well, I mean, I, I feel like with death cab in particular, it's an interesting thing. Cause like, I kind of think they are, especially on the first couple. Like, I, we have the facts is probably my favorite of theirs, and I think that's an emo record, basically. But it's I also going like, to say, 
Sorry, when we're talking ahead. like culturally though, like yes, it's Pacific Northwest stuff, but like I know for a fact Ben Gibber was like a huge Bedhead fan and like posted on like fan forums about them. But he also was a big fan of Undertow and Pacific Northwest hardcore and, and straight edge hardcore not, in particular. I did not know that. Yeah, so he was like into Undertow and Brotherhood and stuff. So like and has covered Undertow, I believe, um, which I think is interesting because he's essentially just doing what first wave emo or like yeah like early emo was which is like i like hardcore but now i'm i've learned about the american analog set and i like yeah. it. and i think it's just because it's his reference points are literally from the other coast of where it started that it just kind of ends up becoming its own weird thing where to me i think that early stuff like when i listen to the kind of interplay between guitars and shit i'm like ah, I, I see this i get it it's definitely yeah. not like as fast as some of the other stuff but I think it has some of the hallmarks in it. And I think he genuinely was coming from a, a hardcore interest. If I were to reference myself from three years ago, because uh, I I came down on the side of I don't think Death Cab or Emo when we first did this episode. But a couple months ago, I went through a period of just listening to a shit ton of We Have the Facts and We're Voting Yes and Control by Pedro the Lion. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I was like, huh, these records are not dissimilar to each other. Oh. In fact, they're very similar to each other in many, many ways. Yeah. And including that Fine, if you get the new Sin Eye Vessel yeah. album, basically. So <laughs> shout to that yeah. one. Well, like, that is the combination of control and we have the facts. Yeah. And it kind of tilted it more in the I can see how they are in the conversation way, even beyond the OC, which I love and must apologize for, apparently. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, straight up. No, it, don't that apologize. Did a you liked it. You liked it. You know. in, in, <laughs> I, I cannot thank them enough. Also, I just like uh, the, uh, the one dude had Adam in his package poster on his wall. That yes. was a very yeah. specific look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To, to this day, Seth Cohen informs a, a terrifying amount of my fashion sense. Um, <laughs> but the, the thing about Death Cab, and I, I feel like we can sort of like use that conversation to volley over to their brother band on this list, which is Modest Mouse, yeah. is that, uh, like David was talking about, there is like a like a a hardcore perspective there that's understated and unspoken, but in an intangible way is still like present. Um, and you can totally hear like the influence of uh, Link specifically on, on like the earliest modest mouse stuff. And certainly by the time of like the moon in, Ar in Antarctica, they are sort of presaging like the modern neo psychedelia movement. Um, but uh, I, I do think that, up to about Lonesome Crowded West uh, and maybe that like really long EP they did right after. Uh, Interstate 8, right? Uh, I, I do think that you can hear like a significant amount of uh, an elliptical approach to hardcore percolating underneath the surface. I, I think last time we basically talked about how like just because it's like something is sad, indie rock doesn't make its emo. And I think we're kind of going the opposite direction that like, okay, yeah, maybe, we might maybe, be overcorrected. maybe yeah. sad indie rock is emo. Um, but I think in terms of like these legacy bands like Death Cab and Modest Mouse, it's kind of like how you, like what your band is doing with that influence. Cause I, I see a lot of like up and coming and local Death Cab sounding bands kind of like taking, you know, maybe like a Death Cab riff in it. Like it sounds more raw and emo than death cab doing it sometimes so yeah. sometimes that death happens cab, death cab leans more to emo like modest mouse that's we're only talking about that because like many bands have like ripped them off well nah. i i was just going to say i think there may be also that there's like a little bit of like an an unexamined like class dynamic thing going on because to my ears death cab sounds very like Effeet in the upper middle class. I probably pronounced Effeet wrong, whatever. I've never uh, heard that word said aloud, so I've only either. read it in, like, yeah. in music criticism. Well, so, <laughs> Whereas Modest Mouse are, I think, I, I would describe them singularly as the white trash indie rock band. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I do feel, honestly, like that kind of like dirty, muddied up aesthetic. Honestly does lend itself more to emo like on like on their earlier records like yeah. i i can hear it i um, mean i but now no sorry, i was gonna say in my experience it's interesting because I, I definitely want to reach for there and like 
though I was obviously the person saying Death Cab is emo, like I really think just that one kind of small era is yeah. and culturally kind of are. But with Modest Mouse, like the first time I ever heard them was someone giving me lounge, Lonesome Crowd West and be like, you're going to love this. It sounds like Fugazi. And I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, kind of. Uh, but I do think there is something where it's like, I know a few people like growing up or like talking about like that kind of class dynamic. I do think they hit a lot of like, my friends were like, I knew someone who had the jawbreaker tattoo on one arm and a modest mouse one on the other. And yeah, I'm like, yeah. I think they've had a little bit of overlap, but it, it very much kind of vanished and eroded. And I think they occupy a weird space because so much of their early history was them like playing live and jamming on songs that were never recorded and were circulated by bootlegs. Like it was mm-hmm. very like deadhead esque. And I've also got a great uh, story about the first time they played the Fireside Bowl in Chicago, which was like the venue where fucking everyone from that era has played this is probably not a story i should tell but whatever if that, if that fucking dude doesn't listen to this is that um <laughs> they played the show and they were staying at someone's house and apparently they stayed up uh until 6 a.m in the morning trying to score crack because modest mouse were just like junky dudes yeah and, like, yeah, yeah. I, I think they like they uh, they sat in a really weird space where you look at a lot of that washington state shit of that time like unwound or carp or like just a lot of that like these pearl dudes and, jam Nirvana. yeah pearl jam <laughs> alice in chains candle um, box you know like two peas in a pod them and Ma- modest mouse yeah but like they they were like the trailer meth kids and like mm-hmm. i think that's it's interesting to see how they like kind of uh went a very different direction at a point well I th- kind of- but yeah i think when you look at like just where in the emo revival like a lot of the bands were coming from it was like a little more like down da- like really bad parts of like west virginia and connecticut and like obviously that's like that's an obvious touchstone for like modest Mat- like how they became uh, the the connection of that stuff with you know a lot of revival bands is you know obvious um but like when i i always thought of like modest mouse is like n- not an e- when i was you know growing up with them like lonesome crowded west era moon and Arc, like that was like that was like a you know mainstream indie like a like a pitchfork yeah. darling they were like yeah. along the same lines as like pavement or uh something along or like neutral milk hotel for that matter you know definitely i like modest mouse a lot more than neutral milk hotel <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, that's another. That's a, a t- that feels like another Weezer esque hot button issue. Neutral Milk Hotel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're not. They're not on the list. I I didn't foresee that being a point of contention. Yeah. Um, Can we piss off the kids with Prince Daddy? Whoa, right. that that is a that is a major shift. I okay. So Ellie, three years ago was when you know you were still riding Sparkle Punk, and was Prince Daddy <laughs> one of the Sparkle Punk fans? Oh my fucking god! I've Correct. aged ten minutes in the past thirty seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, I'm sorry to tell you, Ian, but Sparkle Punk's been over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I I was gonna bring up like I I feel like Sparkle Punk has eclipsed itself. Yeah, I don't I don't remember the last time I've thought of that word. What what happened was the stuff that I was talking about, like with the Sparkle Punk tag, just kind of became DIY the yeah. genre. Yeah. Is, is what DIY. what is diy2 is it like can someone explain that to me i've like seen that come up <laughs> oh it's a it's a joke uh made uh, up by uh chill wave uh, okay. the youtube channel chill wave okay. um basically just like diy twitter kids suck let's all jump ship but not really because the schadenfreude of everyone on twitter is too entertaining where were we prince daddy and the hyena yeah uh Uncle yes we hardly they, hear you. they were th- the reason that I wrote uh, the original Sparkle Punk yeah. article. Hmm. But, like, I, it's funny because Prince Daddy sounds like a fest band. They sound like... They sound like Weezer. They sound... They sound like My Chem. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's almost reductive to call them just an emo band. A lot of contemporary emo, like, I don't know, calling Oso Oso an emo band is reductive as well. So, I don't know. I agree. Or Glass Beach. Post emo, po- post emo uh, innovators, I would say. Like I, they're fifth wave now. Apparently, I think. Yeah. Like, or are we sixth wave? Which wave are we in? I heard we're in um, the fifth wave. Okay. I already said ninth wave. Get with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I think if like something as 
out of the box as Glass Beach, uh, we can call that post emo pretty safely. Then I think Prince Daddy also kind of fits into that post emo type of bubble because they're doing something like th- there's there's like so much like genre chemistry happening on Cosmic Thrill Seekers. It feels like they're like pop punk mad scientists. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you yeah, the Weezer influences and the My Chemical Romance influences I feel are like the most pronounced on that record but at the same time they don't sound anything like those bands Mm -hmm. uh and and they sound like a fest band and they sound like the the kid in your in your dorm room uh who who says that he's smarter on acid like (laughs) (laughs) i mean i think that's the most uh astute way to describe them because i just view them as like I'll call them post emos bane because fucking everybody has that hoodie, and it's just like, <laughs> like it's just like, oh my god, this band is like so modernly big in a weird yeah. way. But yeah, yeah. Like, I see them as one of those weird trans like transition bands of like, I mean, if I guess I was gonna give it like, it's almost like a modern bomb the music industry kind of thing where they're throwing so much together and really kind of coalescing a world that feels like you're either like a fan of them or you're not into any of this other shit. Like yeah. they, they definitely have a kind of kid who just loves Prince Daddy and the high you know, which like, <laughs> yeah. God, bless. God, yeah. God bless those kids. Yeah. I do totally think that like 20 years in the future, there might be like some scene archeologists who are like, and this, this, this hoodie brand Prince Daddy and the hyena was yeah. relative. <laughs> it was almost as popular as Carhartt for a while there. Um, <laughs> this company Bane also makes music. Yeah. <laughs> Fun story. There's literally an entire like. There's like a hundred people in it. Like just a Twitter chat that is just people who own the hoodie. <laughs> like that's the only requirement. What a what a world we live in, man. I Prince Daddy to me is definitely like of the, you know, just the associations who they tour with. They're definitely emo to me, and I don't think they would deny that either. I think they kind of embra- embrace yeah. it, and mm-hmm. also like they're. I, I mean this in a very kind way. Like, there's just, they're so dorky. Like, all of the, everything surrounding it, like the, the hoodie fetishism, like the, the iconography, like the self reference. It's like, there is absolutely nothing cool at all about this band. Like, I love the record, but like, I just, I, I think that I, I tend to think, it, and mind you, I'm coming from like, a pretty centrist indie standpoint like that's the world i occupy for the most part um a band like prince daddy is like they are like somewhere they are like somewhere on the other side of like what the centrist indie stuff is so i mean i think they are i I think they occupy an emo space just because they're if it's uncool it's probably more likely to be considered emo by me if we're talking about modern bands i would agree with that (laughs) <laughs> I, I think the more uncool it is and the fact that they like really openly embrace it i think aesthetically and like really own the fact that like yeah we're fucking dorks whatever that's like that's why i reach for the bomb music industry thing because i just see so much of that energy of like we're dorks we like stuff that people don't think is cool and fuck it we're gonna make that music loud and weird and goofy for the people who like it and yeah i mean it's i wouldn't say it's like when i think of emo do i think of what their music is first probably not but like i think they are like definitely pushing it in a direction that i think in the next five years is going to be really fascinating yeah mm-hmm. let's do little pete oh good one good one Hell yeah. Speaking of, oh man uh, yeah i want to rap is something that i'm not even sure if i'm even qualified to write about in my next <laughs> book because like i mean i have had such a like a weird relationship with hip-hop um, that I kind of like, I, I didn't understand why kids my age in suburban Houston in the late eighties were all like, man, public enemies, 911 is a joke, man, that's my jam. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You don't even know what the hell these guys are, are rapping about. What, what, huh? I don't understand. <laughs> and it seems like there's this attraction to the confidence that comes from hip hoppers. And now what we're seeing with like Lil Peep and a lot of emo rappers is like this whole thing about being very open about struggling with addiction, struggling with identity and all this. And sadly, so many of them are dying in either overdose or uh, violent ways. And so like to me, like it's an extension of the emo idea, 
but as far as the aesthetic, I'm I'm not so on. I don't necessarily see it, but it could be wrong. That's all yeah. I have to say. I'll try. I'll try and put together a playlist for you to to send to you. Yeah. To some degree, this is like a case by case basis sort of thing. However, I do think that there is a sig- significant contingent of SoundCloud uh, emo rap where the only meaningful difference between them and more traditional indie fair, or sorry, more traditional emo fair, uh, is the more obvious auto tune and the 808s instead of like acoustic drums. Yeah. Like the songwriting and. Uh, not even like the choice of samples, but like they, a, a lot of times they will compose like their own guitar work for the songs. Like it's, it's, it's very informed by not, not just like mall emo or like generic, like easily accessible indie rock. A lot of these kids are like genuine, like heads, like yeah. they'll, mm-hmm. they'll create. I think that it's just another example of how like the barrier between hip hop and rock is entirely like arbitrary and constructed yeah. retroactively. As far as my take on this, like I, I'm in the whole subject of like gatekeeping, like I think this is like a sore spot for me. Um, when I think about like how I react in the past, like I remember very vividly in 2016, uh, Pitchfork ran a rising on Lil Peep and call it like the future of emo. Mm-hmm. And I just got like so pissed about that because like, I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm go- talking out of school, but they like, rejected every single rising on an emo band I had ever pitched and were like openly antagonistic towards bands like the hotel year and foxing and the world is, which I think confounded this stereotype that many of the higher ups had of it being like, you know, Oh, just like whiny, like whiny white dudes from long Island, like complaining about girls and depression. And along comes a little peep who had songs like save that shit, which are like pretty much taking back Sunday but oh, now that it's SoundCloud rap, you're saying that like this is it's okay for this stuff to be a part of the music now. And you know, it, when I really think about it, it's like yes, it. I, I never once thought that like no, I, this is the future of emo. Like this is the future. Like this is where it's going. But also, I felt kind of burned from having attended a, quite a few emo night LA. Uh, yeah. DJ nights where it had gone from this, you know, pretty cool like little thing in a uh, shortstop to like this party where like Hollywood agent, like, you know, Hollywood assistants came and like listened to like, um, you know, Fallout Boy, like popular people music. You know, I was still kind of sore about all that, but um, now I think the, 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 the impact of like some of them is just really legitimate. Like, I wish I hadn't spent those years being a fucking hater, but like uh, for all the reasons I had mentioned, like that stuff, like really just left, like it, it made it hard for me to embrace it with the openness I should have. Well, I, I mean, I, I get it. No, I was going to say ahead. like, I, I definitely get it. Cause I've been that way it, with that. It was one of those things where it's like, I think it's hard not to see a headline that's that overstated and not it, it's banking on that reaction a little bit. But it's the same yeah. way I felt where like publications who don't cover punk, like who are like, oh, you know what band's saving punk rock? Ice Age. It's like, all right, get the fuck out of here. Like, <laughs> yeah. you, don't, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, it's it's meant to annoy people like me. Um, yeah. But I do think, Ellie, your point, the fact that like the kind of construct between like rap music and rock music, it, it, you're seeing that not only in like the emo rap stuff, but shit like Ghost Main, which is very much taking hardcore and like metalcore stuff and injecting oh, yeah. it. And that's be obviously Suicide it's existing, Boys. Yeah, it's existing sometimes almost in a horror core kind of realm. But I think like in, at least in those examples, like those bands tour together a lot more frequently. Yeah. And I think that's really the thing that is missing from the emo rap and then like the emo that we've kind of been talking about is that they don't really cross pollinate in those spaces. And I think it's just because, to a certain degree, that shit really popped off so quickly. Yeah. They, no... Well, the underground ones do, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I... So, yeah, I, I, I just want to say, like, I do, I do have qualms with both sides of the argument. On the, on the one hand, I just shake my head at, like, old emo people and, like, young emo kids pretending to be old emo people being, like fuck this shit because it's got 808s like it, and not understanding like the hegelian dialectic of how of how music works um but i also have a huge bone to pick with 
you know, uh, people who completely ignored the world of punk and DIY rock music and uh, treated emo rap like there's been like a gap of 10 years between the last time emo was a thing. And so now like it's it, it's this new popping thing because of hip hop and kind of endemic within that is I also have a problem with uh, the way that a lot of those publications treat hip hop in, in a very like fetishistic slash condescending and paternalistic sort of way. But this, at the end of the day, this I kind remember. of this kind of allowed people to treat both emo and hip hop in a very paternalistic sort of way. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So the one thing that I've noticed is like within emo, I think people who like emo right now allow emo rap to call themselves emo, but they don't want to listen to it. So it's like, okay, we uh, we've allowed emo rap to be called emo rap, but we also don't want anything to do with it. And I think that's really (laughs) weird. It's like, okay, you can post your beats on the on our emo. We're just not going to pay attention to it. It's like, yeah. It's it's very um, weird because it's like we've allowed it, but we want nothing to do with it, basically. But I don't think that's rem- that different historically from when, like, when you look at any genre that is kind of a genre, when it evolves, it's like, you know, when beat down hardcore evolves out of hardcore, there's people who are like, fuck this shit. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's hardcore, but I don't fuck with that. You know, it's the same that happened with, like, death metal and deathcore. It's like, you're like, yeah, it's metal, but I don't fucking listen to it. And I think that's just always going to be the case when you get deep enough into a genre where, like, it has a lot of different wellsprings underneath it. You know, it's like you may when like you punk. make it, yeah, yeah, when you make it an unhealthy <laughs> element of your identity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, I think with a lot of emo rap is that um, unlike I think a lot of the you know emo revival type bands or like you can be an indie rock fan and still kind of fuck with emo revival type stuff because a lot of it imported, you know, Wolf Parade or Broken Social Scene or Death Cab, Modest Mouse. But like emo rap is like such a young person's game. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it's it on on some level, like I feel like I wish I could like that stuff. You know, I wish I could sincerely uh, listen to Juice World or, or Lil Peep or Wiccaphase or whatever and like really be into it and I know if I were like 18 or sit the same 18 year old I was in 1998 I'd probably fuck with this stuff but there's something just it pains me to like ah I know this is not for me you know and that's a hard thing that especially you know as someone who is you know it's kind of my job in some ways to be up on this shit uh, and to realize that like maybe there are these things that are not for me, but in a weird way, a lot of the people who are like trying to shape the narrative of emo rap and or hyper pop, you know, whatever, like whatever equivalent is, it are like 40 year old music writers who grew up on pavement. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's always that kind of dissonance that goes on along with that, you know. This is why being the youngest person in the chat works in my favor sometimes. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I remember back on, like, episode five of this very podcast, like, I had a little bit of a dust-up with Tom Mullen on this very subject. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah you don't say. And, <laughs> yeah. And and kind of, I and I did a, a long-form piece on Little Peep uh, last year for my Bands You Weren't Supposed to Like series, yeah, kind of putting him in the... Uh, I, thought, I thought about that while talking about it. It's like, man, I wish I wasn't such a hater back then. Aw. But I, I kind of, like, was slotting him into, like, the contextual lens of how people thought about Fall Out Boy and My Chemical Romance Absolutely. in their heyday. And while I was writing that piece, I was thinking about, like, you know, I, I defend these artists as kind of belonging within some sort of emo lineage because they, they take influence, of course, but they're also fiercely DIY and fiercely vulnerable and connect with audiences in ways that break down boundaries like of how we think about you know artist and fan relations and uh, breaking apart like parasocial relationships and turning them into real relationships in a lot of the same ways that DIY emo historically has Mm -hmm. and that flipped me around uh, on American football (laughs) (laughs) huh it made me take a more Plot expansive twist. view of what the word was. That, so. I, I, I don't. I, I did not expect that to happen. It's like <laughs> little peep taught me to love American football. I mean, you know, whatever it takes, man. <laughs> well, I I've always I've gone back and forth on how much I like them, but I've I've always liked them. I just had a hard time squaring them 
whatever. We had that conversation an hour ago. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. Do do we have time for one more to close out this episode? Oh yeah. Well, sh- but yeah, got, but or should we just do hard. a rapid fire? All right. Yeah. yeah let's, let's. Yeah. This will. This will. This part will be like the McLaughlin Group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> McLaughlin Group. Didn't I see them open up for a uh, braid at the Fireside Bowl? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, man. They put out that one seven inch, but it was so much better than their demo tape. <laughs> All right. Ra- rapid fire round. Okay. Alkaline Trio. Emo Punk. Nah. Or emo Punk. Pre two thousand emo after no. Yeah. I'm with David. Yeah. Nah. I'm with David. If we consider Jawbreaker emo, then early Alkaline Trio's got to be emo. Yep. Yep. All right. Uh, turnover. <laughs> oh, that's a dream uh, pop band. Uh, Indie uh, pop. Ah, uh, uh, God, nah. <laughs> like I, I, they, they are definitely a band who like may in the early days were like pop punk for mm-hmm. real on Magnolia, but like after that, it's like, look, I fucking love Peripheral Vision, even though it's corny as shit. But nowadays, it's like they seem like a band who's like really would trade all their indies or, or trade all their emo fans to like open up for like Mac DeMarco or something yeah, like that. It's, so. Yeah. it's so amazing that this band can co-headline with Men I Trust and Turnstile back to back. Yeah. yeah. It's very weird. Yeah. It, I think it's the sickest flex. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Like I, 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 you know what? I, I appreciate what they've given me. Pup. Nah. No. I think they're like Rush, Jeff where people band. want... People yeah. want them to be emo. But nah, that that just nah. More than any other, it's just like there's the punk band. Like they yeah. are they are the fest punk band. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. Julian Baker. No. Uh, Multi singer songwriter does an incredible yeah. version of accident prone on piano. Yeah. <laughs> and Hertz Less Early on. is a jaw break. Uh, it, well, sorry, uh Hertz Less is a jaw dropping amazing song. Yeah, I think if 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 things turned out a little differently and she didn't sign to Matador um, and get like really put in that boy genius sort of realm, like mm-hmm. maybe I think mm-hmm. she I think she reps it. I think she reps emo, but like the music, not not so much. Yeah, I think Teen's point, like if she signed to Epitaph instead of yes. Matador and did or more anti, tours with like because yeah. I mean she was on six one three one and did shows with Touche and all that shit. Like mm-hmm. she went more that direction. I think we could have the conversation, but. Yeah, it's. I think culturally, not at all. Yeah. In the same boat. Yeah, you, yeah, she could have put out that. She could have put out that last record on Anti or Epitaph, and the conversation would look very, very different. But mm-hmm. a lot of what we're talking about is like cultural, and yeah, nah, she's she is she is she is uh, Phoebe Bridgers' big thief fans. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's just a sad, icy singer songwriter. Yeah. Remo Drive. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hard no. I don't know enough of your stuff. I'm honestly, I like when you're not that familiar with the band's name and you're familiar with some other bands that have similar names, then yeah. you become the old guy that's all like, you mean like Parkway Drive? <laughs> like, <laughs> nothing, nothing like that. Remo Drive to me is a band. I know Remo Drive at like primarily as a band that people argue about whether or not they're emo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's... Eric, you've listened to Super Chunk, right? Very many, many years. <laughs> well, Seen you don't need to listen to Remo Drive. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> so I can I can just uh, hang on to, you know, my my fond memories of Come Pick Me Up and Indoor Living and Here's the Shutting Up. So I'm I'm, yeah. I'm okay with that. Uh, Bright Eyes. Folk uh, yeah, I, not pre like up to up to lifted. Yes, like in the same way yeah. that early Death Cab is. Mm-hmm. I was gonna say in the same orthogonal the OC sense as Death yes. Cab. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. What was that word? Orthogonal. Yes. I mean, I remember a real Gideon, word. You remember Gideon Yago on MTV? <laughs> yeah. I remember yeah. how he described. He did. They did a piece on Bright Eyes. And I think it was when Lifted was out, and he he described it as like if if you thought Dashboard Confessional was like really intense, this is even more intense. But what <laughs> what what interested me in Bright Eyes 
Um, what's what's the uh, EP that came out before Lifted that has um, the skeletons and the story, the st- soils and the it's got from a balance beam on it. The name escapes me. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, my my friend and the guy that's on the cover of Post, Justin Wilson, talked about seeing uh, Bright Eyes at Rubber Gloves in Denton, and mm-hmm. said it was he was blown away by the intensity of it. And I was like, whoa, who is who's Bright Eyes and you know, lifted hit me at a time that it was like it. It felt like that's what my life was. But I, when I revisit it, I'm like extremely embarrassed. <laughs> uh, orthogonal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the first time I ever heard that word used, uh, it was because I wrote something about metal, and some awful nerd showed up in the comments to say. Uh, excuse me, you said something about uh, Gent being related to thrash metal in this way, but it's more orthogonal <laughs> to thrash. <laughs> so, uh, it, so I think it's only... like adj- I think it's adjacent. So if you were to like, what's the orthogonal version of j- adjacent? Orthog. Yeah. <laughs> orthog or core. Orthog or core. That's what I, I'm going to start a band just to call ourselves that. Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> at the drive-in. Emo. Early yes, I go no. Uh, I I'd split the difference. I'd say in Casino Out and the stuff of that era, very emo. They definitely yeah. were part of the scene. But when you look at like the legs of Relationship of Command, the scene that takes the most from At the Drive-In is like the post Seosin, post Circus Survive, mm-hmm. yeah. like leading all the way up to like Dance Gavin Dance and Sleeping with Sirens type music. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I'm- I'm very much of the attitude that at the drive-in didn't want they wanted to be big, but they didn't want to play the major label games, so they broke up. So major labels found bands that sounded like them that were willing to play the game, like Sayasin. My God, I mean Sayasin has a lot of great songs, but I'm thinking about like Vendetta Red and Vox and you yeah, know the the House of the House of Blues the House of Blues quartet band. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, it, it. same thing happened in the 90s with Pearl Jam. It's like, we want to have our sound, but we're not going to compromise and do this stupid stuff. And so I was like, okay, well, we'll sign Oleander, Candlebox, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and Creed. Yeah. Oh, Who's no. we have to drive in Creed? Kyotos. <laughs> <laughs> Much, yeah. I saw how quickly you came up with that. Yeah. So, yeah. This is not the first time you've had yeah, the drive in yeah. Creed conversation. Yeah. yeah, she uh, Craig Owens was somebody that I described in a in a wrap up of uh the warp tour one year uh for the Dallas Observer. I was like, Craig Owens sings like either he's like trying to sing really high or he's like that toddler in line in front of you at Walmart that just decides to have a total meltdown and it's like and so, so it's like, uh, yeah. Speaking of toddlers having total meltdowns, Hobo Johnson. <laughs> Why did you put this on here? Yeah, <laughs> the, the, it's it. not the E word if we don't have a Hobo Johnson uh, segment, right? <laughs> we haven't talked about it in it's, two years. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a while. Yeah. Um, but he still sometimes gets posted to our email, which is why yeah, I put it on. Yeah, he toured with the Front Bottoms, right? Yeah. No, no. Yeah. no what band toured? It was either was it Remo oh, Drive? Oh no, it was or... a Mom Jeans. Mom oh, Jeans. Oh yes, it was Mom Jeans. No, no now, now we sense. definitely we definitely made this an, an E word <laughs> episode by bringing up Mom Jeans. It took us like two fucking hours. Yeah, but... we, we were. <laughs> yeah, we were doing. Yeah, well. God damn it, Ian, that's your fault. <laughs> Um, yeah, has anyone seen ed. the video of Connor Ober seeing Hobo Johnson for the first time? <laughs> no. Oh, it's so funny. <laughs> okay. Okay. Goodbye, Ian. Yeah. Peace. Uh, yeah. So anyway, fun, fun hangs, uh, put whatever you need for me in post-production. If this show keeps going on or use this opportunity, just... just like compl- compl- <laughs> continue to shit on you or my God or whatever it is that you want to do. Okay. So. <laughs> I'll All try right. and do it's, my it's best uh, impression of you. Yeah. All right. Sounds Ian, good. Good to talk to you, man. All right, man. Peace. See you, Ian. Okay. Do we want to okay. push forward? How many more we got? Let's just four. run through. Yeah. Four. Like, yeah, let's run four. through. Coed and Cambria. I don't no. know the emo roots, but apparently no. they're there. No. No. They, they are there, apparently, but I, I, I say no. And weirdly enough, I do think that they, they draw 
more from like the at the drive in era, uh, or like the relationship command of command era of at the drive in. What I'll say about but, at the drive in in this is like to me, I think those bands in the era people really like falls squarely in what I consider to be the nebulous post hardcore genre, where I'm like, it doesn't really get into the sentimental like lyrically it's so kind of elliptical and like obtuse that i think it's really existing in its own world but like yeah i know coheed like used to play like old like the hardcore fest all throughout new england yeah but like yeah to me I, i've never seen them as being part of it they're more influenced by progressive rock and yeah. you know how many bands do you know that are compared to rush but will also cover a bob dylan song best known by the band yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, or like, like yeah. write the sequel to Jesse's Girl, which I guess they did this year. Like, <laughs> yeah. They, yeah, I saw that. Or, or write the riff to Welcome Home, which is just the Tetris theme song. <laughs> True. I'd have to say, like, as an aside, I mean, Coed and Cambria. They, I mean, the bands themselves and their fans, they have a very unique and very cool relationship, and I just hope that a lot of people understand that, and not like see kind of like the worst of what people will post online you know people who have theories about the amory wars and all that i mean yeah. I, I just I, i'll just speak from experience of like getting to know coe fans and also i i was fortunate a number of years ago to have dinner with uh claudio and blaze james you know at the drive-ins old manager mm -hmm. all very very nice down-to-earth people making Music that nobody else is making, but I've never ever thought of them as an emo band. Mm -hmm. Honestly, the Coheed and their fans vibe, is, I would draw parallels to like Dance Gavin Dance, and then in an even more like not musical but like cultural vibe. Uh, Every time I die, like sure. I, I yeah. think that all of those bands have very similar like relationships with their fans. Yeah, yep, which is very cool to see. Um, Motion City soundtrack. Mm. new wave pop with emo sensibilities i'd give them uh, i'd give them a yes for the first couple yeah, yeah. i think lyrically um, they're, really... they're they're like a little smarter than pop punks which i always kind of yeah. equate to emo for some reason if you're yeah. smarter than pop punk you're I, I just think how much on those like i remember that band being described to me literally because i had friends who saw them play the fireside when they had like the first ep out and they were like it's like Braid covering Weezer. And I was like, and I heard it, and I was like, yeah, that's basically it. Um, yeah. And I think just how many, like, emo references there are and Commit This to Memory with him, like, stealing the drum beat to New Nathan Detroit's or the reference to the Promise Ring song. Like, yeah, I think there's, like, me, a... Not some yeah. yeah, like, I think there's... I think after that, they kind of go into a different space. I don't even really know what to describe it as, but I think uh, they were definitely self-loathing the cars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but I think the first two, they're definitely students enough of it to like ha have a place in it, I think. They took out a lot of yeah. emo bands too. And I think at one point they were like opening for emo bands when they were kind of on a downward spiral of popularity. Yeah. Yeah. And then they went out like co-headlining with the wonder years with like you blew it as they're supporting it yeah yeah St and stuff I, like I that always, happened. i always think about uh when you can't even like find this song on the internet or the video of it but when justin for motion city sang on a grown-up song uh doing backup vocals and like I don't know. That to me is always kind of crystallized. And it was like, yeah, the, he he was down. Like there was video of him doing it in like some shitty fucking basement in Northwest Indiana. So like, uh, I'll give him the credit for. he's due. Uh, I'll find like a demo from the early days where they sound like more conventionally, like Midwest emo and post hardcore influenced. Because I know I've heard it. Um, mm -hmm. I'll send it out. Uh, say anything. At times. Broadway musical emo. Hell yeah. <laughs> Um, I say I say everything up to is a real boy. I I can see like not a, in defense a, of the genre. Uh, I mean some parts of in defense of the genre, but like that record is so scattershot and represents like some of the best and the worst that Max Bemis has ever done. Mm -hmm. um, except for that that weird fucking song on Hebrews where uh, he says something like my people were slaves before yours ever wrapped like oh no oh no max please don't do this isn't uh, there a I late i never got into this because like 
I don't know. It just never happened. So I this is the one I'm, I have like the least informed opinion on. So I can't add to it. There's a late Say Anything album where Dylan from Tiny Moving Parts plays a twinkle riff on it for no reason. <laughs> um, okay. uh, David, at least listen to Baseball. I think that that record okay. is pretty much exactly as Eric described it, like emo with like Broadway, like show tune tendencies, but not in like a gross way. <laughs> Okay, fair enough, fair enough. And then cap it all off with My Chem and Fall Out Boy, and then, you know, Mall Emo kind of all together. It was, it was the mainstream's identity of emo, and it's what a lot of people still think emo is, and I'm not going to disregard it, but I sure as hell will never forget what it's like to tell a large room full of journalism students two years ago saying that I got my start by writing a book about where did emo come from and the whole room laughed at me. <laughs> wow. Yep. So, uh, I mean, oh, but, wow. but, you know, but it's like from their perspective, it's like that I was, it's like I wrote about where did my chem come from and where mm -hmm. did Fallout Boy come from? And it's like, no, 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 there's Braid and there's all this and you know, it, it wasn't like I wasn't taken seriously, but it, I, maybe it was just the way that I said it, but that identity for you know millions of people that are now in their 20s that's what emo was and i can't discount it i mean because it's like i came from i was a grunge kid and you know there'd be people older than me and be like oh man nirvana they're not as good as the replacements you should have been listening to the replacements when you were six years old i'm like no that I wouldn't have understood the replacements at six years old. You know, Let It Be came out when I was five. I wasn't going to get the importance of that record. So when, you know, like a, when a generation, millions of teenagers like something, I might not like it, but if it leads a lot of people to like what we're talking about, how is that really a bad thing? Yeah, and I, I think... Well, <laughs> A lot I was going to say, no, you go. I was just going to say to quote my heroes, broken side. I'm not a fan, but the kids like it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, for me, it's just like, I think it's stuff fits in culturally. I think it was dismissed by older people. And like, even myself at the time with some of it being into like braid or whatever. And then being like, Oh, like Fall Out boys writing songs that like, Grand Theft Auto is like the name of Todd from Braid's record label and shit. You know, it's just like, oh, this is interesting. It's the same way I felt like in the 2000s that like hardcore kind of, I knew a lot of people who had no concept of who like 80s hardcore bands were and thought like the first hardcore band was like a trait you. Boys um, in the Well, yeah. Yeah, shit like that. And like, that's fine. Like, I think with distance, it's easier to be like, it's fine. But I also think like in, if we're talking about like in the same way that I think like, the original lineage of emo, the way that like some like Death Cab kind of came up, or even like My Chem or Fall Out Boys, like those are people coming out of hardcore bands. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, yeah. it was just their next step, and it just it was definitely I think squarely in a post hardcore lens. But it's like you know if if we're gonna say saves the day and is emo, then like fucking take this to your grave as an emo record <laughs> like, yeah yeah um, just is like those are carbon copies basically um and what happens from there is a whole different game but like yeah to me I, I think that stuff has a place in the conversation and i think it got a lot of people in the door and i think it openly like i think it led to emo becoming a genre that like hardcore like punk like whatever is an umbrella with a lot of different stuff under it and i don't know if that would have happened in the same way without it yeah yeah i think a lot uh, of people right n like right now keep trying to dig up more like references from like my chems hardcore days and stuff like that which like cements it more but i i don't even just think call we me need out to. by name kyle well it's, fine. it's right you name. it's literally you and every guest on this podcast uh but like yeah like i don't think we even need to do all that digging i think it's fine calling it emo i mean we're 20 years after it being like the dirty word that it was basically maybe 15 years i don't know when that was was it 15 years ago basically. yeah well, essentially emo the word replaced goth is kind of the like thing yeah. that a lot of people like but are embarrassed as they get older and um you know 
the goth talk sketches on SNL <laughs> were really funny, but for people that took themselves so seriously, it's like, that's my life. And then they get older and it's like, yeah, it was really overblowing things. And I was a very emotional person, but you know, it's, it's like what, what I have discovered, like when I wrote, when I was finishing writing posts, I was like, where is this going? Unbeknownst to me, there were all these young bands, you know, playing basements and garages uh, doing the emo revival thing. And so, like, I, I've now come to the point of acceptance of, like, there's the mainstream version of emo, and then there's always going to be the underground version of emo. And they can coexist, and there can be some blending and all this, but, you know, I, I, I can't hate on the mainstream version of it. Um, but I, I remember what it was like to not like it, but I think it was more of just, like, I couldn't get over things for myself. And so now that I've, I've, I've been trying to be better about getting over a lot of things about myself, I can just like appreciate the Black Parade for what it is and not think like it ruined things. Mm, you know? For sure. And I think, I think we did it. Yeah. I'm All surprised. these bands are now emo or not emo forever. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, David, thank you so much for coming on. My it's pleasure. having you. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for coming on for the first time. It's uh, yeah. Yeah. really awesome introduction. <laughs> yeah, glad to talk to y'all. And, and thanks, thanks, Ellie, for, you know, plugging that little book that could. Because um, Post is kind of this book that uh, I've always championed it, but I've always kind of wondered, are there people out there that really like this book? <laughs> um, and so, one like... Of, one of my all-time favorites. As far I mean, as it, it, journalism to, goes. To get into it, it was huge for me. Like, I remember being a kid into all this stuff, and that was like the one book I could find that yeah. was out that was touching on any of it. And it was like, and again, I, I said it earlier, but it's why, like, for a long time, you know, I don't think I was using the word emo as freely because I was viewed it all as post hardcore, you know? Like, it just kind of felt like that to me for a long time. And it, I don't think it was until it exploded that I think more of the reclamation came, you know, with yeah. people taking it on a little more. I, I just I, knew that there were going to be people out there that, that got it that say people at major publishing houses didn't. And so, like, that's I mean, I walked away from a book deal for what eventually Leslie Simon wrote as Wish You Were Here. But mm -hmm. that was not the book that I wanted to write. And so um, I just stuck to my guns and even though it's a self-published affair and I can understand that people want to, you know, pick it apart because it was self-published and all this, um, I just really, really appreciate that there are a, a lot of people out there that do connect with this book and, you know, want to talk to me about it because it came out 11 years ago. And honestly, it's like it's because of people like y'all that that's why I want to do the sequel or, or the long afterward to just kind of give a nice coda to it because it kind of ends on this big question mark and yeah. and after interviewing many people for the dallas observer and using that as research and then doing my own research just in the last year or so um i it's something that i hope you guys will like but i i really really appreciate people really caring about something that i wanted out there even if it was just a very small audience a fuck like fuck people who pick it apart for being self-published because it's DIY as fuck, mm -hmm. right? yeah. and I always, I always loved that about the book. And it didn't feel like sloppy or amateurish. It just felt very. It's very well uh, done. Yeah, and it, it, but you. it also carries that like authenticity. And not to shit talk Andy Greenwald again, because uh, <laughs> nothing feels good did a, a lot for me. Like before Post was out. Um, mm -hmm. But it is a lot. It's both more comprehensive and more accessible. So, good work on that. That yeah. was thank you <laughs> for yeah. people listening. Is it still available to be purchased? Yeah, uh, you can buy it on Amazon, um, Barnes and Noble. I mean, it's available on Amazon all throughout, all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, and and also, I, I also have this attitude of like, if you if you can't afford like a physical copy of it. I have a name your price sort of thing. I can just send you the PDF. I mean, it's it's just I want people to to read it. It's not something that I, you know, I'm making lots of money in. But I actually did receive the biggest royalty check out of all the eleven years. I, I got a royalty check for eighty two dollars a few months ago. But <laughs> yeah. but it's just but it's just more from the perspective of uh, you know I know of other writers that are like 
oh my god, my book was found in a used bookstore, or I only made 15 cents off that royalty check. I see that as, you know, an $82 check is like, that means that there are people out there that still want to read a book that has some dated information at the end of it, but they can really connect with the story of it. And, and um, you know, I'm planning on self-publishing Forever Got Shorter because, you know, nobody, <laughs> no publisher wants, wants another book about emo unless it's like just about the mainstream stuff. So thank you all for carrying this torch and having this kind of communication you know it's it's like also with like tom mullen and you know other people that are still wanting to share this kind of stuff about music that really matters to them and i'll always treasure my 10 year old coffee stained dog-eared copy of that book <laughs> um uh thank you ian for coming on oh yes oh, pleasure 8.8 .8. <laughs> <laughs> Well, congrats right. on three years, y'all. Uh, keep Thank doing you. it. Uh, genuinely a pleasure to be a part of it. And uh, this was a lot of fun. So thanks thanks for inviting my uh, my dumbass on who <laughs> can't even keep his uh, thumb on his hand. So, you know. Well, we love you so much, David. Oh, yeah. and, you know, you know, just like me personally, like from the bottom of my heart, really appreciate our friendship. Right back at you, bud. All right. I'm going to smoke a real cigarette. <laughs> <laughs>